So hello everyone and welcome to the third webinar of Ideas, Inspiring Dialogues for Environmental Action Series, uh, a monthly presentation by the My Future, My Voice Youth Ambassadors, uh, wherein we invite successful and eminent people like Dr. Robinson to share their experiences and lessons with our young climate leaders. Um, as you all know, these sessions are moderated by Youth Ambassador and we hope uh, through these inspirational talks, all youth get inspired and gain knowledge to lead on environmental issues in their countries and across the globe as a uh, whole and my future my voice initiative is really working on. For those who have joined us for the first time, uh, my future my voice is really an initiative by earthday.org uh, that was launched last year, last year on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, it brings together young, uh, young environmental leaders from across the globe and our aim really is to provide them a platform to share their tried and tested techniques that have helped restore our earth. Um, as you know, and as you will hear Abir, who's also our youth ambassador, uh, how incredible these youth you know, are working towards uh, really taking actions for the environment. And uh, through this platform, we really want to build these bridges and uh, bring together across uh, youth across political borders and spaces. And as we speak today, we have some 170 youth from 86 countries on six continents just in a year time. And we hope to reach our magical 100 soon. So if you would like to nominate any youth leader from your country, please uh, write to us at 50 years of EDN at gmail.com. Uh, and we'll also make sure that the emails are there in the chat box for you to see. So each leader accepted into the campaign has really a proven track record of environment. So please, when you nominate, do make sure uh, that uh, these are environmental leaders and not some, you know, who are just starting uh, their, you know, focus on this area. Um, coming back to today's topic, uh, there is enough and more evidence. And I don't think I'm, um, we'll be talking a lot today about plastic pollution and its impact on the marine life and human health. Um, but I just wanted to pinpoint here that earthday.org is very committed to bringing together individuals, organizations, and also businesses, and basically everyone who is interested, as you will see from our website, www.earthday.org. Our programs are really designed for each and every one, for anyone who wants to really work on environment and focus on that, to basically, uh, you know, to commit to the removal of out of control waste that is trashed on our planet. Because what we believe is that the, the planet that has already been trashed with so much of waste is not going to go magically away. Someone really needs to get dirty down there and clean it up. So that's why our global program, which is called the Great Global Cleanup, really commits to the removal of millions of plastics from beaches, rivers, lakes, surroundings, neighborhoods, any place, uh, all you have to do is go to our global website and uh, register your cleanup. And we really want to, uh, we are committed and want to have, you know, as many cleanups done around the world. And already there is a very interesting map, which is uh, kind of, you know, an interactive map, which can be accessed by anyone. And if anyone wants to join uh, these cleanups, they, they are happy, you know, we're happy to, um, share that information with you and they can easily see themselves also through the map and also through this campaign we really want to share there are lots of more materials available on the website so if you're interested in these cleanups you can access that on the resources and knowledge sec uh, section and uh, especially in india our focus is really on cleaning up the water bodies and as you would know uh, the river ganga which is considered very holy in our place in india um, it's been talked about a lot and most of you would know how polluted it is as we speak today. We saw during COVID times it getting much cleaner, but that was a very temporary phase. And now we're, as the businesses again open up, as the life still uh, moves on, it has again become more and more dirty. And that is again contributing to more and more plastics and waste in the uh, bigger, larger bodies, seas and oceans uh, as we speak. Uh, specifically, our focus here is on cleaning these water resources and also to promulgate a ban on the use of single-use uh, plastic in areas that have larger footfalls, like temples, large shopping centers, or larger communities where people live. And I'm happy to state that our, you know, uh, one of the large temples, which is highly revered, Golden Temple, that had been declared uh, plastic-free. 
uh, given our advocacy work with them. And similarly, the state government of Himachal Pradesh was also declared uh, plastic free. This is more for our context, Dr. Robinson. I mean, what we have been doing here in India, and I'm sure that people here would like to know what we uh, really aim to do uh, through this, uh, also through this interaction. So uh, we really believe, and uh, we will also back it up that, you know, and that is why our global petition also pushes for that, that climate literacy right from school and that's why we have this My Future, My Voice campaign, because we want to start fresh and start young. Uh, we believe that citizens will be able to make better consumer and sustainable decisions only if they start very young and to make those educated choices for our planet. And that is why this initiative also really focuses on bringing children and youth as moderators for these sessions with experts, because these are the ones who are really stirring you know, things forward and you are the ones who are guiding them through. So that's why we want to bring and bridge those connections. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm very happy to introduce, and we all by now know that the issue of plastic pollution uh, is a huge concern, and it requires many more hands and many more brains uh, to really solve the problem, basic problem of not littering. I mean, it shouldn't be even, a, it's not even a bad, big problem, it's just a basic problem of not littering around yourself. So we're so glad today that we have Dr. Nahan Robinson with us, uh, who will be in dialogue with Abhir Bala. Uh, to unravel this issue in greater detail for us. Uh, just a brief introduction about them. Dr. Nahan Robinson is an accomplished marine biologist with considerable experience in conducting viral outreach campaigns uh, for ocean conservation. In 2015, he was filmed removing a plastic straw from a sea turtle nose. And this video has now been viewed over 100 million times in YouTube. Wow, I mean, that number itself is, is really striking. So. Uh, and this video is often acknowledged as a crystallization movement for many anti-plastic campaigns and has instigated global behavioral change. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Robinson, for agreeing to be with us today and for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Um, and in dialogue is our youth ambassador, Abhi, who at a very young age has been featured by Ms. amongst the foremost youth environmentalist internationally for his work on air pollution and waste segregation. He has several initiatives that aim to enhance uh, awareness on climate issues. For instance, uh, through his climate change podcast that's called the Candid Climate Conversations, he helps to build awareness about these issues. Abhir also actively engages with several environmental nonprofits in India and in England to advocate for reforms in emission policies and standards uh, to really help reduce the effects of air pollution. Thank you so much, Abir. And before I hand it over to both you gentlemen to take it forward, just a little housekeeping before. Uh, this will be an hour long webinar and there will be time for questions and answers in the end. If you have any questions during the presentations, please um, raise your hand or you can also write, us, write to us in the chat box or Q&A. And I'm sure Abir will be very happy to take them up and ask our presenter. If you'd like to speak and ask, please raise your hand and we will try our best to have you ask directly. However, given our last two experiences, we have been running out of time yeah. because of the very interesting. So we might not have you in, but we will try for that. Um, and I would now request first our regional director, uh, Asia Org, Mrs. Karna Singh, to please share your few words before we turn it over to speaker and moderator for the day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nishu. You said it all so perfectly. Thank you for doing that. Uh, Dr. Nathan Robinson, my young friend, Abid Bhalla, the world is yours. Please take it forward. Please inspire us. Oldies like me have made a mess. I'm sorry about that. Please help us rectify it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and thank you for the very gracious introduction. Um, Nishu ma'am. So um, yeah, today we're going to be talking about uh, plastic pollution and uh, its impact on, um, you know, marine life. And just a few, you know, just wanted to add a few comments on what was previously discussed and mentioned. Uh, so if any of you have questions, try and put it in the Q&A box. It's just easier for us to track it over there as compared to in the chat box where there are the comments coming in as well. Um, but I mean, if you prefer, you can put it in the chat as well. Um, that's number one. The other thing is that um, we're going to try and have a conversation for around half an hour. And after that, we'll take questions for around 15 minutes. 
Uh, so do send in your questions, but also do listen in first because some of your questions might be answered, uh, you know, uh, in, in the half an hour that our interaction lasts. Um, so just, and, and the third point, of course, which is very interesting, I, I was seeing that there's a lot of school students here, uh, is that today is a very special day uh, for the environment. Well, not special, but an important day because um, less than an hour ago, the IPCC just released uh, their report and I'm yet to go through it, um, but it's not good news. Uh, so that, that makes this conversation um, even more important and even more relevant. Uh, and for those of you who, who may not know, the IPCC stands for the Inter, um, Interplanetary Committee on Climate Change. And uh, so, yeah, uh, that's, that's basically, uh, you know, a few points that I wanted to make. Uh, so today with Dr. Robinson, um, you know, as Nishu Ma'am said, uh, the first thing, of course, is that I don't know if you guys remember, I remember this very clearly, uh, four or five years ago um, on Snapchat and Instagram, on Facebook, there was this video which was going crazy all over the internet where there was, um, you know, a plastic straw being taken out of a uh, tortoise's no, uh, nose. And um, I didn't know it then, but a few months ago, I discovered that Dr. Robinson was the man behind the camera. So, um, it's, it's really interesting uh, to know that and to know how that one video has sort of impact and shaped our understanding uh, around this issue, uh, not just, you know, back then, but continues to do so even now, because typically with things over the internet, you see something and two days later, it's forgotten because, you know, something else comes up. Uh, but that's not true for this video. So that goes to show how really, you know, um, important it is. Uh, so yeah, I think I think we're gonna get started with the conversation. But anything you wanna say, Dr. Robinson, before I get started with my questions? Uh, yeah, a, a couple of things. First of all, a huge thank you. Like it's always a pleasure to chat to you up here, and thank you for inviting me to be part of uh, yeah the the discussion today. And thank you, Nisha and Karuna, for such a wonderful introduction. It was wonderful to hear about all the incredible stuff that you're doing. So it's an honor to be able to yeah be part of this discussion. Um, secondly, I love the fact that you brought up the new IPCC report. I've, I haven't been able to read it yet, but I've been waiting for a while because I think it's, it's such, I mean, the IPCC reports, they are the kind of, it's the most up-to-date information we have on climate change and the way to move forwards, um, led by the world leaders on this subject. It's a really important thing for us to be going through and... <clears throat> One thing I found super fascinating was since the first report, um, the message of the story has changed somewhat. It started off being pointing out climate change and talking about what we needed to, or pointing out the issues of climate change. Then the second report started talking about the severity about like talking about tipping points when we're going to be going too far. And the, the final reports, they've been very hesitant to talk about uh kind of global planetary modifications to address climate change and in the last reports they released they finally started talking about uh, like geological engineering engineering our atmosphere and what blew my mind was just for me this was just a way of this is how serious it is we're so serious it's no longer just pointing out the issue this anymore there's people out there who are actively considering things such as spraying chemicals into the environment to create more clouds, to create more shade so that it reflects more light, which is the potential to have, yes, to address climate change, but cause huge problems at the same time. And we're at a situation where this is getting so serious that we actually need to start bringing these ideas to the table. And seeing that was the previous report they published two or three years ago now, I'm very, very interested to see what they have to say now, because it's as we can read in the news with the wildfires that are going on around the world, like, this is the here and now and change needs to happen. Um, so I'm just, I'm just excited. If you want to talk about that, I'd love to talk about that more. And then the final thing I just have to add quickly was um, for the straw video, I just want to mention that the person actually behind the camera wasn't me. The person behind the camera was a dear friend of mine, Chris Figner. She's a wonderful biologist and people, please go check her out online. She was the one with the camera. I was the one trying to, pull out that thing but i just need to want to make sure that 
credit is given where credit's due. And Chris was the one who actually had the fantastic idea to, my first thought was, I need to rescue this turtle. Chris's first thought was, I need to grab my camera. And without the two of us together in that same place, it, it wouldn't have happened. So I always would like to give Chris a good shout out for the, the work she did. Yeah, of course, it's it's the creative genius behind the camera, which matters as much as mm -hmm. the person helping out, uh, you know, the, the uh, animal in need. So, yeah, no, definitely. And uh, I know that you and I can have a whole other conversation about the IPCC report. But what I will say is that the interesting thing which I've seen from the headlines is that they are certainly assigning individual responsibility towards countries this time. Uh, you know, there's there's more clear accountability and responsibility that's being imposed. Um, but time will tell whether that works out or not. Um, so anyways, let's let's get started with this talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, I think the most basic question, uh, you know, which which comes to mind when we look at your career, all the places you've worked um, all around. Hello. Okay. We can hear you. Yeah. We can hear sorry, you. sorry. I think my my Zoom froze for a second. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was saying. Um, I think having seen um, you know, everywhere you've worked and all the cool things you've worked on, the first question that comes to mind is how you actually went about uh getting into this field. How did you sort of go from being a student to being a marine biologist? That's a that's a fantastic question, and yeah, it's a fantastic question. I. I'm very fortunate. I've been a huge part of my career has been luck, being in the right place at the right time. And I think for a lot of us, uh, we always have to acknowledge there is a big component of just being in the right place at the right time. But there's also lots of kind of other other things that play a big role in getting you to where you want to be. And I'm sure Avi, you can tell us an amazing story about, for example, how you became such a prominent spokesperson for like uh, air pollution and plastic pollution, all these things. Um, for me. I always loved nature. I always loved marine biology. So I knew I was going to pursue something and then it enabled me to follow um, my passions. And I actually went to, I went to university because I grew up in the UK uh, and I studied marine biology. But at the end of my degree, at the end of my master's, I was actually kind of um, dis dissatisfied, let's put it that way. I, I wanted to be doing something active and I, I was doing a marine biology degree because I wanted to be part of conservation and I felt, wanted to feel like I was making a difference in the world. And as much as I loved my university course, I just felt like I was learning facts, but it wasn't applied. I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I wanted to be out there actually making a difference. So I started looking for volunteer opportunities um, and I uh, yeah, started looking for volunteer opportunities worldwide and I had applied for a couple of projects working in different places around the world and in the end had to reject a bunch because I couldn't afford them. Uh, so I started looking for the cheapest opportunity possible um, that could have me working with a big marine animal and I ended up working with sea turtles because there's a wonderful organization in Greece that's uh, called Archelon, the Sea Turtle Protection Society of Greece. And all you had to pay for was your food. You lived in campsites, you lived in tents, so there's no accommodation payments. This is back when flights from the UK to kind of Greece were relatively cheap. Uh, and I went there, lived on a beach, protecting sea turtles night and day, and I fell in love. Um, and I just, I put my heart and soul into that project. They offered me a job. I came back after working for them for several years. Um, I was uh, kind of, scouted for a different job working in Costa Rica but once again doing more or less the same thing sea turtle conservation and the vast majority of my career uh, has kind of actually I've from that kind of first opportunity where I just found it worked as hard as I possibly could and then ended up all of a sudden another opportunity came up I ran at that and I kept working hard it's all come between being in the right place at the right time working incredibly hard and following your passion. Like if I wanted to do marine conservation, so that's what I dedicated my time to. And people, people notice when you put in the kind of hard work and hard effort, yeah, people notice. And sure. People are always looking for other people who are 
just as kind of dedicated to the cause as they are to bring into these teams, to build into other initiatives, to really start making change. So that's, that's kind of like how my trajectory went. I just ended up bouncing from project to project um, based on recommendations and opportunities from other people. And you got to see the world while doing that. So that's fantastic. But, um, you know, another question that um, a lot of us have when we, when we look at this field is what's the difference between someone who uh, takes care of these animals? So, for example, a, a veterinarian uh, of, say, you know, an injured marine animal, that's mm -hmm. probably a rare sort of, you know, uh, a line of work as compared to what you do. Um, you know, are you, are you sort of qualified to uh, cut them up and perform surgery on these animals or is there a different sort of, you know, um, a different job for that? There's, it's a, it's a, it's a different job more or less. So I'm a, a biologist, I do mm -hmm. research. Um, and then there's veterinarians who do actual animal care. So the, I guess the way I often think about it is uh, I actually work with a lot of veterinarians who are the people who are trained in medicine of sea turtles. And I, it is, I work in a rescue center right now here in Spain. And lots of those people are actually trained in say, so, yes, if they have to cut open a sea turtle or perform surgery in a sea turtle, they're the people who do that stuff. But I'm the stuff who tends to do a lot more research in the field. Um, as a biologist, my work is, tends to be more focused towards, say, protecting sea turtles as a population as opposed to protecting individuals. And I think that's mm -hmm. a key difference between um, biologists and yeah. uh and veterinary students and it actually reminds me of something someone uh, a, a dear friend of mine um several years ago was where we'd been working on sea turtle projects for a, a very long time and she mentioned to me that one of the saddest things that she can think of is working with wild animals you can dedicate your life to protecting them and she dedicated years to protecting this one species of sea turtle the olive ridley sea turtle actually which you have huge populations of olive ridley the largest populations of olive ridley in the world are in india um, but they also nest in costa rica and she was saying that she found it sad that after dedicating her life to protecting the species on several years she would never have a rapport with the animals she would never have uh the animals would never appreciate it in a way and i remember seeing that and just thinking it was it's literally it's one of these ideas that stuck with me for my entire life because for me i actually kind of think the opposite i like the fact we're trying to protect these animals to leave them alone. They stay natural. I like the fact that it doesn't matter how many years I dedicate to working with sea turtles or squid or any other species I've worked with, I'm still a stranger in their habitat. And that's yeah. kind of what captures my imagination yeah. when I work with these wild animals. I think it's, some of us have different ways of looking at life. I think people who have that more, the, if you're trying to protect an, um, I, I, the reason I make that story is because I think there's a difference there between a lot of people who want to work mm -hmm. in veterinary science, who want to protect animals, but like the connection with animals. And I think yeah. conservation science is a little bit more that people who want to protect wilderness. You want to protect something where almost humans don't even belong. Yeah. No, that's very interesting. And another aspect that, you know, uh, another thing that I picked up on uh, was the fact that you said you went out there and you volunteered. Um, mm -hmm. And that's interesting because when someone's finishing their master's degree or when they're finishing up with college, their first concern is, okay, how do I get a job? How do I make money? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, what was your career trajectory like and what motivated you to first volunteer um, and then sort of look at, you know, because I'm in the same stage now, I think I finish university in a year or two from now, mm -hmm. and I'm starting to think about what I want to do, how I can bring together the environment and, um, you know, also pick up a job in the same area. Mm -hmm. And I started off, you know, volunteering as early as class six, I volunteered or volunteered with a bunch of nonprofits. And now mm -hmm. over the past year or two, we've been fortunate to get a few grants and a few stipends from a few nonprofits, mm -hmm. for example, to produce my podcast or, um, you know, just to work with them on a few issues. Um, so I definitely understand how it opens, you know, career opportunities for you in the future. But what was the sort of, you know, motivation for you to first work as a volunteer and then take it up as a job? So I think it, what this hugely... I mean, it's difficult to answer this question um, without considering all the different financial backgrounds that people come from. Um, mm. As I said, I consider myself very fortunate. Growing up um, 
growing up in the UK in kind of a, a stable household with my parents having a stable income. So I didn't feel the insecurity of when I say finished university, I had the luxury of being able to say, hey, I can spend how many months volunteering. Um, and lots of people don't simply don't have that luxury. And that's, um, and that's his own issue that needs to be addressed. Um, but for me, it was all about, I knew what I wanted to do. And I knew, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in animal, uh, marine animal conservation. Um, and that was, once again, fortunately for me, that was my priority. Uh, and for so many of these organizations, I think, um, and this is for good and for worse, the only way to enter into, say, conservation or uh, research is actually taking these kind of volunteer routes. That's how you show that you're willing to, for without pay, and sometimes even paying, dedicate your time and efforts to these causes. And then the very fortunate among us are then able to start to build a career into that. But unfortunately, as many of us kind of realize, it's not a Sometimes it's not an easy path to create a living doing conservation. As you said, you are you're trying to figure out what to do next. You've been able to, you've been kind of one of these talented individuals who's been able to secure a couple of grants. Um, and I think it's an unfortunate case that the world doesn't have more opportunities so that people can go out there, start working towards something they think is important, protecting the planet, and also be able to make a living out of doing that. It shouldn't be a no, you can work for a multinational corporation and make your money and then do your volunteer work on the side. And then you're kind of uh, working both it sides. It needs to go hand the, in hand, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, then we need to start creating more and more opportunities uh, so that people can start dedicating their life to conservation, uh, fighting plastic pollution, to cleaning up beaches, to all these things and make a living out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think brainstorming ways to achieve that is so important uh um and that way i think for a lot of young individuals that would be a lot more fulfilling i think a lot of the issues that a lot of young individuals have when they're making this decision between what do i want to spend my life rest of my life doing there's the choice between doing something that's personally important for you and then there's doing something where you make a solid living and you make a decent income and we need to we have to as a community start getting things together and having people working for the planet but or making that decision because it's good for them it's good for the planet it's good for everyone i mean getting yeah, there i think is a, is a wonderful a wonderful direction that we need to be heading in okay so um two more questions uh and you know changing tracks a bit from the career side of things um i was looking up your wikipedia page which is super <laughs> cool and i was seeing that um you know, there were two things which I found interesting. One is, of course, the, the video which we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And the second is that you were the second or the third person to record a giant squid. Mm -hmm. um, right. So the first question that I have is, of course, you know, if you could tell us the backstory behind uh, how you sort of rescued that turtle. How did you, you know, where were you? Um, how all of that happened? Uh, and, you know, was it like something, did you have to take the turtle in? Did you have to take care of it for a few days? Or was it just mm -hmm. like, take it out and, you know, sort of release it back? Um, and the second question, of course, is about this giant squid thing. Because to me, it's, it's uh, you know, I remember when we spoke last, I think you were telling me some of them can grow as big as the size of a bus uh, or something like that. And to record something like that, let alone see something like that and get out of it alive is fascinating. So if you could tell us a bit about both of these experiences, that would be great. Yes, love to. So for the straw, I was, once again, Chris, who is the person who recorded the video, she was, we were both working in Costa Rica at the time. Uh, I had, I was running a research station and a conservation project for uh, the endangered, critically endangered leatherback sea turtle. And Chris was doing her PhD research. So she was completing her doctorate. Chris needed some help. She, her plan was to head out on boats and start sampling turtles in water. So finding sea turtles and she was collecting little tissue samples because she wanted to study the genetics of the, of the olive-related sea turtles. And she needed help with someone who knew how to 
uh, work with sea turtles, kind of catch sea turtles in water. And I was also running a project looking at epibionts and epibionts are the animals that live on other animals. So little barnacles or crabs, crustaceans, things like this that live on sea turtles. Because uh, the reason I found those very fascinating is the animals that live on sea turtles can give us a lot of information about the sea turtle themselves. They can tell us the turtle, if the turtle's healthy or how old it is in some instances or where it's come from or what it's been feeding on, all these kind of interesting questions. Uh, as we were pulling one of these animals out of the water, I noticed something wedged in its nostril. Um, so after Chris had collected our samples, I went to go collect, um, yeah, went to go collect this item and I actually thought it was an epibiont. I thought it was a tube worm, an animal that has it's a worm, but it has a shell. Uh, and I thought it just started growing inside the nostril of this unfortunate animal. Uh, but when I started pulling it out, we realized it was, it was a plastic straw. It was, I've still got it by me, but it was this, this plastic straw wedged the whole way. Um, and we actually cut a little bit off first and bit into it. This wasn't the most hygienic thing in the world, but because we were so baffled on the boat as to what this was, it was only when we bit into it, we realized that it was plastic. Um, so that's the, that's the backstory really behind why we were there, what happened. Um, and I mean, I could talk for ages on that subject, but that's the backstory behind that. And then the giant squid, I have to give credit to another absolutely inspirational researcher, Dr. Edie Widder. And Dr. Edie Widder is, was the first person to ever record a giant squid on video, and she recorded it in the waters of Japan. Uh, she did it by designing a special deep sea camera. And this camera is kind of like a, the way Edie designed it was like a stealth camera. The whole idea is previous attempts to try to film giant squid have actually probably been scaring these animals away because we use bright white lights to try to see these animals, but their eyesight is so sensitive that they can probably see us a lot before we see them and they just stay away from our cameras. Edie's idea was to build a stealth camera. She used it in the water of Japan, recorded the first hour of footage. Then you fast forward several years later and Edie and I had started collaborating because Edie is one of these people who really appreciates the connection between science and science communication. And that, and due to um, kind of where I was working at the time, I was working at a research institute with lots of connections to Edie and her work. We'd started to work together and we had taken her old camera, we'd taken it apart, we'd refitted, we'd improved it in some ways, we tweaked some things. And after I'd spent uh, yeah, a couple of months kind of working on the camera, Edie had invited me to join her on a cruise in the Gulf of Mexico to deploy this camera. And we knew there were giant squids in the Gulf of Mexico, but it's not exactly a giant squid hotspot. We, they've, a couple of individuals have been found dead, kind of washed up at the surface, but there are other places around the world where they seem to be a lot more common. But when you're doing deep sea research, you often don't get to pick. You don't just get to say, hey, I wanna go here. If there's a vessel going somewhere, you just join whatever vessel, you join with the opportunities you have available to you. So we went out and every day, like day and night, I'd be deploying this camera, sitting it in the water, uh, waiting for the, and then recovering the camera, then checking all the footage that we downloaded. And I had gone through, I think 120 hours worth of footage of which 99.9% .9 of it is probably nothing uh, until we had that one moment where we saw the, we saw the giant squid on camera. And it was a beautiful moment because it's first time this species has been filmed in, first time this species has been filmed in the US, first time it's been, second time it's been filmed worldwide. We're talking about a species that literally thousands of people have tried to film. We're talking about species that everyone knows about, but we just never ever record alive on camera. I find it nuts, this idea that species is so well known that it can be in ancient Norse mythology and kind of blockbuster movies, but we still don't really know what it looks like when it's alive. Um, so it was an awesome, absolutely awesome moment to be the first person who was able to see that footage, the person who was able to capture that footage. And now, Edie and I have actually kind of redesigned the camera once more, made it even better than it is. And our plans for the next couple of years is to take that camera to a couple of other cool places around the world and see if we can get more footage. There's a couple of other big squid out there as well that we're really hoping to try and film. So as far as if you're into squids, yeah. yeah, watch yeah. this space. 
Yeah, for sure. I think that's something we're all going to look forward to. And maybe you could, I remember we discussed this the last time we spoke, maybe you could um, try and work since you have a few years, maybe you could try and figure out a way to geotag these, uh, you know, squids. I know it's tough because they're slimy and they're so big. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, if, if you're making a new camera, maybe you can figure something along those lines out too. It's difficult, but these are like the wonderful questions that we have to think about as scientists. Um, as scientists, we're always trying to ask new questions to get more information about the marine world. We know we've developed the footage for filming these animals. Now, the next step is to try to start tagging them. Look at their movements. Are they migrating? Are they territorial? Like how many do we have in certain areas? So 100%, yes. Would love to geotag where that's that's all part of the future. These are all plans that we're dreaming about, but in 10 years time, they might very much be true. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed. So another question um, that I had for you is, um, you know, you've, you've been fortunate to work around the world, Greece, Spain, the US, uh, different places. Um, and, you know, you would have also had an opportunity to experience, um, you know, uh, things that you have with this turtle or in, in, in mm -hmm. general, you know. So in your experience, do you think um, certain countries uh, are more stringent about the way plastic is let out into their oceans as compared to others? Uh, would you say that, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico, you found a lot more plastic, but then uh, something was actually being done about it as compared to, say, for example, lesser plastic off the shore of Greece with nothing being mm -hmm. done about it? you know uh uh so i think it, it's actually a, a difficult question to answer because with regards to marine plastic pollution there is marine plastic pollution in every country on this planet there's no there's no country that you can say we've done they've done such a good job that there's yeah. no plastic on their beaches there's no plastic in the waters and in every country that i've ever seen at least, and I think almost every country in the world, I, I could be wrong, but um, I would say the vast majority of countries have some people trying to fight this fight. Now, mm -hmm. different countries evidently have larger organizations or a more, mobile, or a more mobile workforce who are able to address these problems on bigger levels. But what is nice is that... Um, well, it's nice as there's, there's people in every country who are trying to make these differences. Sure. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I think that's the best way I can answer this question. Some countries definitely do better jobs, but I think it's less of a country difference and more about like the organizations within the, the countries that are really leading the charge. I mean, there's some wonderful examples around the world of big governmental change. So countries banning... Uh, reusable plastic, reusable plastic bags. I mean, you look at a country like uh, New Zealand, for example, and they banned plastic bags like a decade and a half ago, two decades ago almost now. Like they're so far ahead of the curve, it's amazing. Um, and then you're talking about other countries around the world where plastic bag bans are still, I mean, look at Spain, for example, like you have to pay for plastic bags, but there's no ban on them. They're still knocking around. Uh, we still haven't implemented much legislation to really have to change people's use of plastic bags. Um, uh, so there's big differences in how governments have started to tackle these issues. Uh, and I think some of the big changes we need to start seeing is some of the some governmental organizations. And I'd love to see corporations mm -hmm. uh, being involved in this as well, because there's some wonderful ideas um, there's wonderful ways that organizations can start to uh, yeah. address these issues. And one of, my, one of my favorite ones actually came out of the UK several years ago. I don't know if it's still in effect, but they did this for a while of, they started paying fisheries. So fisheries, so going out and dragging nets for fish, of course, to feed people. Um, but as fish numbers have started to decline, the government started paying these same fisheries for the amount of plastic that they were pulling out of the nets. So all of a sudden, the government was actually getting, kind of paying fisheries to make the oceans cleaner, which at the same time means they can still make an income, even if they're not catching that much fish. And the more plastic we get out of the ocean, the more fish there will probably be. So it's kind of like this, ideas like that, I think are wonderful incentives that I really do think yeah. governments should have. Um, we should put more 
governments need to have more responsibility for making these changes. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. And I think there are so many of these ideas. I know um, there's this non very prominent nonprofit in the UK, which is uh, literally tossing boulders into the sea because they have these ocean trawlers mm -hmm. which throw a net down and, you know, just pull and catch all the fish mm -hmm. down from the ocean flow. So what this nonprofit is trying to do is they're putting boulders there so that the nets get torn mm -hmm. and, you know, these um, trawlers can't catch so many fish at once because mm -hmm. that's disrupting the corals and all of that. So I think, yeah, I mean, innovative solutions like that are definitely the way forward. Mm -hmm. um, talking about, um, you know, the impact on marine life, um, how is climate change and perhaps plastic pollution more specifically uh, impacting the biodiversity in terms of, um, you know, marine life, ocean currents, uh, certain, you know, we have ocean currents which are being blocked off uh, by floating, you know, uh, dumps of plastic, literally, it's like a landfill of plastic in the ocean. Um, so how is that impacting marine life in general and turtles in specific as well? So both of those issues, climate change and plastic pollution, what makes them so... One of the things that makes it so important that we address this as soon as we can is they are affecting every level of biological life in the oceans. There is no animals, there are no habitat that is spared from the impacts of climate change. If you live at the surface in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, or you live at the bottom, the deepest points of any of the oceans in the world, you're being impacted right now by the effects of climate change. Water is getting warmer globally. It's changing circulation patterns. Um, so the world, the, with re reference to climate change, the world is changing and there will be winners and losers. There are some species that, some species that can't handle higher temperatures and they're going to start to die out. There'll be other species that can handle the higher temperatures and they'll start to thrive because of all the reduction of, say, the other species that they once competed with. So some species, jellyfish are often great examples, are going to start thriving. But then lots of the other species, say the sea turtles in the ocean, the whales, the sharks, some of these species that can't survive in hotter temperatures, we're going to lose. So what climate change, even though some species will thrive and some species will die out, what we will see is a mass reduction in biodiversity, which to me is kind of taking the magic out of the ocean. The magic of the ocean is all those incredible different species that you can see. You can go snorkeling, you can go swimming, you can swim through the ocean keep counting different species for the rest of your life and you're keeping this surprised by something new we're losing that we're losing that diversity uh it's it's painful to see and not just when i talk about like the magic of the ocean but also when you talk about the way that the ocean ecosystems work they depend on all these different species fulfilling all these different roles to produce this healthy whole as we start to lose species in that chain, then certain ecosystems start to collapse. Once again, if an ecosystem collapses, it might not be this complex ecosystem with whales and dolphins and sea turtles and sharks and fish. It might just end up being an entire ecosystem made out of one species of jellyfish. Um, and these are the changes that we really have to try and avoid. These are the changes that are going to start affecting our world in a huge way. When it comes to plastic pollution, once again, plastic pollution is so ubiquitous. It's in every habitat on this planet. They found plastic at the bottom of the deepest point in the ocean. The Mariana Trench, Challenger Deep, it's over 11 or almost 11,000 meters straight down. There's plastic down there. Like they've, you, uh, you do a lot of work with air pollution. We also know that plastic, airborne plastics, are now found at the top of the Himalayas. Yeah. Like, the toppest point, the highest point of the ocean, the highest point of the planet, the deepest points of the ocean have plastic in it now. Yeah. And plastic has this strange, um, almost insidious effect because it's sometimes difficult to assess exactly how much an impact plastic has. For example, a sea turtle might eat a plastic bag. Now, that sea turtle might be absolutely fine. Might just eat that plastic bag. It can't digest it, of course, but it'll pass it out three or four days later and keep going on with its life. But 
certain plastic of certain shapes so after certain amounts once it's eaten one plastic bag it might be fine two might be fine three might create a blockage kill that animal um and i mentioned this because it's very difficult for us as scientists to quantify the exact impact that plastic is having on oceans or even for a single species like sea turtles mm. but what we do know is that the vast majority and a lot of studies have shown this the majority of say sea turtles out here right now have plastic inside their stomachs uh okay. and so the problem is huge the problem is huge we need to address it we don't know exactly how big but there's no denying that it's out there and it's effects are widespread sure okay uh great so now i think wow time has just gone by we have 15 minutes left so what i'm going to do is merge some of the audience's questions with some of mine um one question that i was keen to ask you is um you know in your own perspective what kind of environmental regulations um, could be effective in controlling this, you know, plastic pollution, particularly in international water bodies. Um, from your perspective, I know you're not a policy expert, nor am I, um, but do you think legal actions would be necessary for, you know, making, making effective control? Yes, very much so. I think it's, I think to address the issue of climate change, we need to throw everything we can at it. So we need to have individual change, individual behavioral changes. So people in restaurants asking not to have straws or using reusable plastic bags, making sure they recycle their plastic. We also need governmental change, imposing policies and laws and things like that to minimize the amount of plastic that's making it into our oceans. Now, I think where the government, a couple of areas where say the government's policy and regulation has a huge potential to make big impacts is they can start to dictate wide wide scale programs that minimize the amount of plastic production in the first place and like i said great examples are there are countries around the world that basically said okay no more plastic bags or at least if you want a plastic bag you have to pay five cents for each plastic bag so all of a sudden the responsibility now comes into the individuals to say hey wait i don't want to pay a little bit extra i'm just going to bring my own bags and that overnight can start to massively kind of decrease the amount of plastic uh production and plastic product like if we want to stop my plastic getting into the ocean we need to reduce production we also need to reduce we also need to increase recycling so we need to reduce the amounts getting out into the ocean and we also need to have efforts in the ocean to take out um plastic and without all three of those efforts we'll never succeed so we need efforts in, in all fronts but simple things like that making bans on plastic bags bans on plastic cut uh forks reducing policies that impose that say supermarkets or stores or things like that have to have less plastic packaging on things they're trying to sell these can be changes when you're ordering things online and when you're mm -hmm. buying whatever furniture for your house and things like this there are number there's methods to reduce the amount of plastic that you need just in terms of plastic packaging uh and then there's also ways to change use say biodegradable plastics plastics yeah. that you can actually use so they can have the same say packaging purpose but they don't live they don't need to last for the next thousand years they need to last for the two weeks it takes to get whatever the, what you've bought on amazon to your house and then once it sits in your rubbish bin it disintegrates back into nothingness in a couple of weeks we need we need policies yeah. that need to make that in my opinion need to make that legal that shouldn't be a choice we need we need efforts to make this a where we know these are solutions to effort, problems yeah, yeah. we concentrate yeah. efforts to fix those so um, we are, actually have uh, my fellow youth ambassador from Philippines, um, Renate, who wants to ask you a question, um, which is that do you conduct environmental education uh, specifically about plastic pollution, um, you know, sessions in other countries and, uh, you know, what's the best way to reach you for that? Uh, and also while you're answering this, I've got a lot of requests from the audience to see a few photographs um, if you could show us some of the photos that you have um, during your, your expeditions, that would be great. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, so, do I do kind of uh, plastic education sessions? Um, 
Yes, yes and no. Uh, what I, I focus most of my efforts in, in things like this, online webinars, podcasts, uh, seminars, working on panels, things like this. This is why I think is the best way to uh, reach big diverse audiences. And my goal is less to, um, my goal is to reach the biggest audience possible. So that's why I like working with different organizations every uh, every couple of weeks, different ways of communicating, because this, I think, reaches out to the broadest amount of people. So I do a huge amount of this, but I don't have, a, say, a specific course that I, I offer. Um, and once again, my research itself, my strategy is about creating these videos that I can share globally with people and start wonderful communications like this, more so than trying to kind of focus that in a, in a classroom setting, I actually think outside the classroom is a better way to learn these, these, these messages. The best way to follow what I do is to, or the best way to reach out to me is probably via my Instagram, uh, wild.blue.science. Uh, it's the same for my Facebook as well. And if you send me um, messages via that, I promise to um, get back in contact and I'm always happy to talk to people about some of the wonderful initiatives they're doing around the world and share more information. So please feel free to check me out and reach out. And then with regards to uh, sharing some sharing some photos, I guess I'll tell you what, I have a, a presentation on in the background and so I was thinking of is this the same turtle or this is a different one? This is the turtle that had the plastic fork. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, caught in its nose. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll play this video because this video is very quick. And then mm -hmm. what I'll do. So for the people who don't know, it wasn't just a, a straw we found. About two months afterwards, we found another animal. This is once again in Costa Rica, very close to where we found the original one. But this time it had a plastic fork caught inside its nose uh it's actually this this plastic fork and it gave us some evidence that what's happening with these animals evidently this end of the fork can't get wedged into the sea turtle's nose we actually can get swallowed these items mm. much like the straw and then when it tries to regurgitate it because it can't swallow this it's getting caught into the internal nostrils like your nostrils actually connect to the back of your throat in people and in sea turtles and it's getting passed out and that's why the head is buried deep inside the, the turtle right. but if you want to see more footage about expeditions and things like this i guess i'll show you this um i'll show you a quick clip just because i really like this this video and it gives you a little bit of example of some of the other stuff that i do one of the projects i ran in the last few years was called the turtle cam project and the idea is we we're putting cameras onto the shells of sea turtles and this is in the Bahamas, as a way to study their behavior, look at what they're eating, look at their critical habitats, as a way to start to figure out how to best protect these animals. But it also gave us some wonderful footage of what it's like to swim through the ocean like a sea turtle. Uh, and I'll show you a little clip. So this is several, several of our clips uh, put together. We actually have about 200 hours of footage of... Wow sea turtles being sea turtles. Did you get any of the sea turtles? Uh, I mean, did you catch footage of them uh, being eaten, unfortunately, by a shark or something? Does that also <laughs> happen? That must be scary to watch. We don't actually have any footage of we ha I actually have lots of footage of sharks but I have no aggressive footage of sharks interacting with these sea turtles most of the sharks that I was seeing in the Bahamas at least in the habitats where we find the sea turtles are relatively small um, mm -hmm. there are definitely some larger individuals out there who would eat a sea turtle but we never caught that on footage on camera what we did film was a lot of social behavior between sea turtles and this is very interesting because we always think of sea turtles as solitary individuals kind of mm -hmm. they do their own stuff but what we discovered from these videos is sea turtles are actually incredibly social they will often swim up to each other kind of check each other out rub heads a little bit or kind of sit next to each other for a few minutes and then swim off on their own ways in fact they can barely swim past another turtle without checking it out in some way 
And what was so interesting about that is we don't understand the purpose behind this yet. The, the turtles in those videos are non-reproductively active. They're juveniles, they're teenagers. Um, so they're not mating. So we're still trying to figure out why these animals feel the need to kind of check in with each other, see if they're doing, seeing everyone's okay. But it's a, a wonderful story that I really like. And it's uh, yeah. uh, something we're still trying to figure out with that project. Well, I think it's visuals and questions like this, which will inspire so many others perhaps uh, to take an interest in, in this field. Um, great. So I think just one or two more questions from the audience very quickly. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, we have a question from Elsie who's asking, uh, over the years of your experience, has over tourism uh, and newfound accessibility affected our planet's oceans, uh, its wildlife and their respective ecosystems? Yes, in good and bad ways. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'll give a sea turtle example. You, if you go back 50 years, I go on, and I'll give you, I, there's an example I say, I can talk about from personal experience in Costa Rica. If you go back 50 years, then poaching of sea turtle eggs, so harvesting of sea turtle eggs was very, very prevalent on kind of both coasts of Costa Rica. And there is a population of leatherback sea turtles on the Pacific coast that was experiencing, it used to be one of the biggest populations, nesting populations in the world. And it is, when scientists arrived and started collecting data, they realized the population was in free fall. Basically, people were taking so many eggs that there were no young turtles replacing the old turtles anymore. So all you had left was old turtles. And as old turtles were dying out, the populations were crashing. Now, a couple of amazing scientists and researchers and conservationists and activists got together and tried to come up with a solution. And the solution was to start turning the people who are harvesting eggs um, into eco tour guides. So now they provided, so they provided these uh, people who are harvesting eggs with a bunch of kind of training in tourism. And then they, this tour guide started taking, paying tourists to see nesting turtles instead of taking the eggs. Now there's an incentive to actually protect these beaches and protect these sea turtles because the more sea turtles there are, the more turtles they can show to their tourists. Everyone's happy. They actually make money out of their being lots of tourists the problem is there's a balance somewhere uh at what when you start having lots and lots and lots of tourists behind uh turtles you have the potential to disturb the nesting turtle um things can happen like people can walk on the nest accidentally and even destroy the eggs there's there's lots of you can just have more stress from the animal it might still nest but it might be stressed because it can kind of hear people talking or see people walking around it so there's a balance there. In some ways, ecotourism and tourism has been a huge positive, net positive for the planet. It's made people more excited to protect animals. I think if you talk about, um, I'm sure um, you spoke about something like the gorillas in kind of Rwanda and Uganda. One of the reasons that people, so many people around the world, I think are very passionate probably about gorilla conservation is because they might have had an experience where they've gone, seen them in the wild and feel converted. They want to dedicate their life to kind of protecting these animals now. But at the same time, having, bringing people into these habitats has also led to kind of habitat destruction, transmission of diseases between, zoonotic diseases between humans and animals, things like this. Um, so it's a complicated question to ask. It's not... The increase of tourism, and especially ecotourism, has been good in some sense, bad in other senses. Um, and the key is, once again, as always, finding a balance. Sure, absolutely. There's, um, again, just pairing up the questions uh, because we're running out of time. Um, one is just general trivia, which I thought was very interesting. What do you think is the world's largest and smallest fish? I think the sperm whale is the largest, but maybe you can take that. Um, and secondly, and more importantly, um, are there any examples of plastic digesting organisms, uh, much like cellulose digesting organisms, which have been found in the ocean? And is there any research being done in this aspect with the aim of controlling plastic pollution? I think... Oi Kuga, if I'm getting the pronunciation right, has asked this question. Hey, some wonderful, wonderful questions. The biggest fish in the ocean is actually the whale shark. 
um, the biggest animal in the ocean uh, is the blue whale. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Um, as far as the smallest, I, I don't know what the smallest fish is. A baby fish. Let's just say a baby fish. Um, can marine organisms or can organisms eat plastic? Some can. So there are species of bacteria they've found that are able to break down uh, certain types of plastics, not all types of plastics, certain funguses who are also able to break down other types of plastics and types of oils, like crude oil, sometimes can actually be broken down by certain types of fungus. And very interesting is mealworms will eat polystyrene. And there's I've got a wonderful friend of mine who, a uh, Bahamian researcher who does actually lots of really cool projects where he's been using mealworms as a way of kind of organically breaking down um, kind of styrofoam packaging. And there's actually lots of stuff you can research about this online. So there are some biological alternatives, but there's no one species that's going to save our planet. There's no bacteria and all we need is just a million one of these bacteria and they're going to eat all the plastic out of existence. No, 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 we need to start. Mm. It's kind of like recycling, right? You don't recycle everything at the same time. You've got to separate your glass from your plastic from your cardboard. That's what we need to do. And then we have all these little tools and we're a growing array of tools to start tackling these different types of plastic. Like I said, some bacteria, some fungus and mealworms are an amazing one as well. Okay. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I think the last question for today would be, um, what is, uh, you know, what would be your advice to other uh, young people such as myself who are aspiring to sort of take an interest uh, either in, in the environment space in general or more specifically um, in, in this area of uh, marine biology? Um, so, I mean, if you're really interested in conservation, marine biology and environmental activism, the f- most important advice I think I can give is just get out there. Whether this means volunteering, whether this means making your own Instagram post from your living room where you kind of create your own videos, come up with a mechanism that works for you and the resources that you have available to you and start getting out there. Start making your voice heard. Start making the changes that you want to see. That's when things start happening. There's no one who's going to find you sitting in a living room and just say, you are the person I want to make this change until you start getting out there. So once again, this could be studying at university and following a degree in uh, environmental conservation or up here doing what you do like leading all these wonderful podcasts and things like this invite people ask people to talk about this start creating these conversations you can do these things some of them yes of course not everyone can jump on a plane and fly around and start volunteering with certain organizations but you can sit in your living room start designing kind of questions to ask people and build your own podcasts and things like this like we have access to these resources use those resources be inventive but get your name out there that's the best thing i can recommend definitely i think those are uh golden words for all of us uh so thank you so much thank you for taking out the time and uh, this has been very insightful and i'm sure everyone's taken uh, a lot away from this session uh so yeah thank you so much and back to you nishuma Thank you so much. I mean, um, this one hour, I don't know where it went. And I think you've covered all the, all the, so much. Thank you, Robin, for so efficiently moderating it. Um, I think, I mean, I don't have anything else to add. Just, uh, just to note that, you know, in the year 1970, when Earth Day movement started, it was with a young, person who was all of 25, Dennis Hayes, who started the whole Earth Day movement. And it started then and, you know, has been inspiring 50 years from now. So uh, definitely, I would say that you have uh, in them like Abhir and even Dr. Robinson, you when you started, you were so young. So I mean, there's so much to learn and so much to get inspired by. And um, on that note, I would just say thank you so much for doing what you do. Uh, Karunaji, if you have any uh, closing remarks and Uh, Just thank you to all the youth and thank you for the researchers such as Dr. Robinson who inspired them. It's a different world where youth today have the opportunity to go out and do what they want to do. Uh, Different from my times where we followed a very regimented path. So uh, let me thank the parents of people like Abir and the many other My Future, My Voice 
uh, youth that we have, that they have encouraged them to take this on as a career, uh, as an interest, as something that they can do for the earth. So thank you all. Thank you all very much. Well, I'd thank like you. to, uh, yeah. sorry, I just, I'd also love to say thank you so much for having me again. It's been a pleasure. It's been so nice to see all these little comments kind of popping up in the chat. So thank you for everyone as well, for everyone listening, for uh, like paying attention and thank you for all your efforts that hopefully spin out of the show to start making the changes you want to see. So this is amazing initiatives. Uh, I'm happy to have been, to have been part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Robinson.